Bonjour and welcome everyone to our uh, latest edition of the Global Indigenous Speaker Series. I'm just going to start with introducing myself. Um, Lana Ray, Nadizhna Kaz, Weskne Gijigo, Gindigo, Ajao Kanoje, Nadodem, Apoganisinin, Nadunjaba. Uh, so I'm Lana Ray. I'm from Lake Helen, uh, Red Rock Indian Band is, is another name. And I'm also Lakehead University's Research Chair in Decolonial Futures. Um, and I also want to start today by acknowledging some of our, our territory here our, and our lands and, and our waters. So miigwech kichigami, miigwech kama nestekwa zibi, miigwech mejubiju, miigwech namama aki. So it's my pleasure um, that we have with us here today, Dr. Kelsey Leonard, who's going to be speaking to us about Indigenous water justice for planetary well-being. And I think it's such an appropriate time to have Dr. Leonard join us and have her talk couched in between International Women's Day as well as the upcoming uh, World Water Day on March 22nd. So as many of you will know, uh, for us as Anishinaabe Kwe, as, as Indigenous women, uh, we have a, a sacred responsibility to the water. So those days are help remind us of that, but obviously it's something that is ongoing and is, is something that uh, we think about and we do on a, on a daily basis. So now that I've uh, provided a, a traditional introduction and, and followed some protocols of our territory here on Anishinaabek territory, I also want to provide an institutional land acknowledgement. So Lakehead University respectfully acknowledges its campuses are located on the traditional lands of Indigenous peoples. So Lakehead uh, Thunder Bay is located on the traditional lands of the Fort William First Nation, signatory to the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850, and Lakehead Aurelia is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg. Uh, the Anishinaabeg include the Ojibwe, the Adawa, as well as the Potawatomi Nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. So Lakehead University acknowledges the history that many nations hold in the area around our campuses and is committed to a relationship with First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples based on the principles of mutual trust, respect, reciprocity and collaboration in the spirit of reconciliation. So before we get into things any further, I also just want to run through a couple of housekeeping items. So firstly, an important notice uh, that this event will be uh, video recorded. So uh, we're doing this to preserve a record of the event in the university's archives, as well as to publish and promote Lakehead University. So by attending, you are agreeing to be included in the recording and its public dissemination in any media now um, known or later developed anywhere in the world in perpetuity. Uh, secondly, all participants are muted, uh, and this is to ensure continuity throughout the event, and, and so we're not all interrupted as we hear Dr. Leonard's um, important message and insights that she's going to share with us. Uh, thirdly, uh, we're going to have a question and answer period at the conclusion of the lecture, so please put any questions that you have uh, within the chat box. And now at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce Elder Audrey DeRoy from Lactamalac First Nation, who will share with us an opening prayer. I believe I'm unmuted now. Oh. Aha, bonjour. Bonjour Gakna, we are greetings to everyone. It's an honor to be here this evening and uh, to be here to honor the water, to listen to a scholar, a doctor who's gonna be, you know, giving us so much tonight of everything that she believes in and everything that she thinks about when it comes to the water, the Nebe. As a woman, as a water protector, a life giver, a life carrier, 
is he chi me glitch gishi manito no come suck me show suck for me no bamaz one for this good life that we have wabanung shawanung ninga bewanung ki waitanung for the four directions creator chi me glitch baboon for the winter season for all the snow that we have <laughs> it makes me so happy because you know when when we have this much snow, I know that Nimama is going to have a really good drink, you know, as she heads into the next season. And all the plants, the animals, the, all the water systems, the veins of the earth, our mother, will be well taken care of. And I pray that the water is always kind to us too, because the water is so powerful. And, and, uh, <clears throat> I think about our life, you know, and all the forms of water that we have here. I know when I look out the window, I see a Nishnabewe Gichigane, the Great Lake. It's it's like a big ocean out there. And beyond that, I see Nanabojo. Nanabojo, not to forget about all the lessons that Nanabojo has taught us through our lifetime. Chimigwich. And I thank you, Lana Ray, for giving all that, you know, respect to all the water systems that are in this area. And to think about all the water systems that are in the area that you are in. To give thanks, say, to that river of life for our little children that are coming each and every day. And this very second, there's a child being born. Give thanks to that river that flows from us. Chimigwich for the water that lives within us. When we start taking care of the water, we start taking care of ourselves. And so with that, I want to say Chimi Gwich for the Sama that was uh, dropped off here. It's so important to have that tobacco. It makes me feel so good when I receive it because I know everything will go good. And everybody that's in this virtual lodge right now, that we are all being recognized for, for taking the time to be together, to take action, to love the water to respect it and to take good care of it. So I'm gonna open up with a song. It's uh, asking creator and our ancestors to come and sit with us, to be with us this evening. <clears throat> Thanks to Sin, the rock beings, eh? Without them, we wouldn't be able to communicate right now. To Gidigans, to all the plants, the mushkiki that we're burning tonight to away suck all the animals that give us life each and every day. <clears throat> Yeah. 
Nick, no comes. Benda Kishi Mane go way. Again, for the drum, for that Nagaman, that song, that very old song to welcome, you know, creator of all things, uh, created everything that we see, hey, and our grandmothers and grandfathers that are always looking after us every single day and every single feeling that we, you know, how we're feeling today. So how me, which, kicking a D my mug and I call my relations. Miigwech, uh, Alder DeRoy, Elder DeRoy, and uh, want to acknowledge your drum too for that uh, that beautiful sound. And uh, I know with your words and that song that you sang of of just putting us in a good place where we really listen and and could uh, be open to to hear what Dr. Leonard is going to share with us. So at this point, I want to introduce uh, Dr. McPherson. Uh, who will be sharing a bit more about the Global Indigenous Speaker Series, as well as uh, formally introducing our speaker for tonight. So, Dr. McPherson. Thank you very much, Dr. Ray, and uh, Bujo, good evening, everyone, and uh, Chimigwich Elder DeRoy, thank you so much for your prayer, for your song, and for your messages. I so appreciate you opening our gathering again today, this evening, in a good way. Our Research and Innovation Week is focusing on planetary stewardship, the act of respecting and caring for our Earth. And we know that research and innovation can be a catalyst for change. And we're also reminded of the environmental and social inequities and that this is a time to listen, to learn, explore, discover, and most importantly, to act. This evening, it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to a special lecture, which is part of both our Research and Innovation Week, but very importantly, is the next lecture in our series on the Global Indigenous Speakers Series. The purpose of this series is to help share Indigenous knowledge approaches to contemporary issues. Indigenous knowledge systems can be used to understand and address non-Indigenous issues by helping us reimagine how we perceive our future. Tonight, we are very well, very honoured to welcome Dr. Kelsey Leonard, who will deliver her lecture entitled Indigenous Water Justice for Planetary Well-Being. Dr. Leonard is a Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Waters, Climate and Sustainability, and an Assistant Professor in the Faculty of Environment at the University of Waterloo, where her research focuses on Indigenous water justice and its climatic, territorial, and governance underpinnings. Dr. Leonard seeks to establish Indigenous traditions of water conservation as the foundation for international water policymaking. She has been instrumental in safeguarding the interests of Indigenous nations for environmental planning and builds Indigenous science and knowledge 
into new solutions for water governance and sustainable oceans. In collaboration with a global team of water law scholars, Dr. Leonard has published in the Lewis and Clark Law Review on Indigenous Water Justice and defining and the defining international legal principle of self-determination under the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Dr. Leonard's lecture on Indigenous water justice for planetary well-being recognizes that water is a living entity with inherent rights and to whom we have a duty of care. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Leonard. Brittany, thank you so much for having me and uh, Chin Gwich to Elder DeRoy for that wonderful prayer and welcoming and, and song. It's, it's good to be here with all of you and have these great spirits uh, guide us in our conversation this evening. Um, so just bear with me for one moment as I get my slides loaded and we will dive right in. So there we go, slides are loading. Um, as was mentioned uh, by President McPherson, thank you so much for, for having me again and for everyone um, as part of the Global Indigenous Speaker Series for this invitation to speak with you all tonight. It is really uh, wonderful to be in, in good company. And although virtual, I have really wonderful and fun memories of the Thunder Bay area uh, during my time doing my PhD and, and getting to visit some of the nations uh, that are out in, in that part of the Great Lakes Basin. So a real pleasure to, to be here with you this evening. And if you'd like to uh, tweet along, if you're on Twitter in that space, uh, my handle is at Kelsey T. Leonard. I also share that with you and I'll share my contact information at the end of today, slide deck as well, that if you'd like to reach out and continue the conversation, um, I would be thrilled to do that um, either on Twitter or, or over email. So with that, it's really important. Um, I, think, I think I mentioned and, and started out the top of my talk and in the introduction, it was also shared that I'm a citizen of the Shinnecock Nation. So hello and good day. We are a First Nation, tribal nation located on the east end of what is currently known as Long Island, New York. Uh, traditionally to us, we know it as Pominock. And you can see here, this is the eastern portion of the island. And it very much informs who I am uh, as, as a person, as a human being on this planet, thinking about what it means to, to take care um, and to be in good relation. And so in our language, Shinnecock means people of the shore. So it's that place where, where fresh water and salt water mix and that water comes to land. And so it very much informs how I see myself. I think, uh, I'd like to say, I think my ancestors had a really a uh, great foresight and in naming us that and, and in giving us this, this power to acknowledge the, the beauty and the gift that we have uh, to be located in a place surrounded by water. And with that gift comes a great responsibility. And so uh, for many of you, you'll see in, in the background today behind me, uh, wampum beads. So for those that are unfamiliar with my part of the world, we're along the Atlantic Ocean, so a bit far away from where I now am zooming in from in southwestern Ontario on the Nishnabek and Haudenosaunee territories. Um, we are known for harvesting uh, wampum. Uh, it comes from quahog and whelk shells that are birthed in our estuary and waters along the Atlantic seaboard. And once harvested, uh, we use all the shell like most uh, Indigenous peoples and how we harvest and take care of our food systems. And in that process, after um, having some good uh, food uh, based out of those clams, making some really delicious clam dishes, we also then would car the, carve the shells and that would make the wampum beads. And that is also a bit of how I see myself and the work that I come to uh, today in, in working in the Great Lakes region and working in water governance and water law, because as Indigenous peoples of the, of the East and of the Great Lakes, some of our first transboundary water treaties were constituted with wampum, were constituted with those wampum beads and made those wampum belts. And I think it's very 
important to understand the connection that we have across all of the water uh, from our oceans to the Great Lakes. And so that is a bit of what brings me to our conversation this evening. And with that, I also want to acknowledge some of the, the wonderful mentors and thinkers that inspire this conversation we're having this evening. So this quote that I have before you uh, shared here is from uh, the late Josephine Mandemanbaugh who said, we're all born of water. We're all connected with the water. We're all related in that way. Even though we're not related by blood, we're related by water. So water is very precious for us. Um, and I was so fortunate to have um, met and, and learned from uh, Nokomus Josephine Ba. And also there, I think, are a few others tuning in this evening that I want to acknowledge, um, not only uh, Nokomus Josephine Ba, but also the water walkers who have been very instrumental in empowering this conversation and reimagining what our connection can look like to water and should look like to water, and also how we can rematriate and reclaim a lot of those traditions and practices that we have about understanding our deep and inherent relationships to water through law and through policy and through just being good human beings on the planet and towards the planet. And so, um, as I mentioned, uh, the water walkers, there's also some wonderful youth leaders out there that shape these conversations on a daily basis um, through grassroots activism, uh, not only as water walkers, but also as leaders for their nations. Uh, one I can think of that is always a very inspirational youth for myself is Auden Peltier. She's the uh, Anishinaabek Nation Chief Water Commissioner, and then a whole cadre of youth from around the world, Indigenous youth, who make up the mini Kiwaka uh, decade for indigenous water um, and who annually, although virtually during COVID, um, meet to share about their experiences related to water protection and how we can ensure that the water is protected for future generations. So I wanna bring them into our conversation this evening, as well as um, in, in acknowledgement of Milkamus Josephine Ba, uh, the junior water walkers and all of the water walkers that her life has inspired um, and continues to inspire. And so with that, I, I wanna acknowledge that a lot of what we're speaking to you today and what I'm sharing with you today is a part of a global conversation. It's not uh, Dr. Leonard's story. It's not Dr. Leonard's research. Um, it's about amplifying the voices of those who are on the ground fighting every day to protect a relation, to protect the, the water. Um, but for me, and you, you'll note for the talk this evening, it, it labels and identifies this concept of indigenous water justice. And this concept was born out of an indigenous gathering that was held in 2016 at the University of Colorado Law School in Boulder, Colorado. Um, it's also, uh, Boulder is also the home of the Native American Rights Fund and so many indigenous legal minds have come out of that particular part of the world. And so it was very um, serendipitous that the gathering was held in Boulder and we had indigenous peoples from the Columbia River Basin, the Colorado River Basin and the Murray-Darling Basin in Australia coming together to talk about what some of the water injustices were that they were facing in their particular parts of the world and how we might create a collective vision through international law that would support indigenous rights and rights of the water itself to thrive, exist, and naturally evolve. And so out of this uh, experience, this symposium, we had international legal scholars like Barb Cousins of the University of Idaho, Sue Jackson out of Griffith and Melbourne Universities in Australia, Jason Robinson out of the University of Wyoming, um, and Dr. Dan McCool out of the University of Utah, um, who's written one of the seminal texts called Native Waters. We all came together to try and capture what had been shared during the symposium. And what we came out with was this paper, uh, as mentioned, published in Lewis and Clark Law Review, which also, uh, the the name of the of the law review does not does not miss is not or is not missed uh, on me. Um, you know, we we sort of have two colonizers uh, named for the law review. It's actually the law review is named for the university and the institution. But in that, we also are putting forward this paper that uh, tries to debunk a lot of the imperialistic and colonialistic notions uh, uh, that have been applied to water um, over the past two centuries. And so 
I think in a lot of ways, it is quite fitting. Um, but this paper is open access. You can download it at any future point in time if you would like to reference it or learn more about some of what I will share with you today. Um, and it's available on SSRN, and we will make sure that the link is, is shared widely with you. Um, it is a bit long. It's a law review article, so it can get kind of hefty and complex. And so that's why this evening's conversation really allows us to do a bit of a deeper dive and pull out some of those main key findings from the paper. So what is water justice? What is this, this concept and, and where did it emerge from? Well, within sort of the Western water literature, we often hear that water justice is described as those injustices that are importantly about structural water scarcities caused by resource capture and the resulting patterns of unequal access to water and decision making spaces. And so again, there's this focus here, as you might note in, in these definitions, on a sufficient quantity and quality of water to meet human needs. And that's generally what we've heard in the context of water justice. And that was in the early 2000s. More recently, there were some attempts by, uh, like in the paper by uh, Swartz and Bolins in 2014 to expand on the definition. And they say that water justice, it importantly consists of attempts to creatively link demands for redistribution with those for cultural recognition of efforts to improve the political participation of those who have been excluded or whose voices are silenced and of actively interweaving diverse struggles for water justice across contexts, differences and scales. And so our team built from these definitions and we said, well, these are good, but there's something that's still missing. There's something that's not being accounted for through our indigenous experience of water injustice. And what we found that the sort of elephant in the room was colonialism, was the way in which institutional discrimination and in how water decisions are made as was, was not being accounted for in the contemporary definitions and concepts related to water justice. And so, when we, dipped, when we delved even further, we also noted that the specific and explicit notion of water colonialism as the dispossession of indigenous lands for water projects and the normalization of white settler modes of land and water use is what is the marked nature of indigenous water injustice. This colonialist aspect of how we have this disenfranchised and removed from our ability and autonomy and self-determination rights to protect water is very much linked to the types of injustices we experience as indigenous peoples. And within this, there are layers of cultural imperialism, Eurocentrism, and throughout this, we also saw that despite these aspects of water colonialism, there were resilient and innovative pathways that indigenous nations were responding to colonialism. They were saying, well, if you won't let us into your institutions, we'll create our own institutions. Um, here in the Great Lakes region, that emerged after a series of legal cases fighting uh, for indigenous treaty, treaty fishing rights that formed the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, GLIPWIC, which is now one of the preeminent climate and fish science entities and institutions in the Great Lakes Basin. And so, so much emerges uh, from these patterns of colonialism in spaces of water regimes. But we also noted that there needed to be a path forward. We had documented the ways in which indigenous nations were responding to colonialism historically um, through the 90s and 2000s. But what was our path forward in the 2010s to now where we are in the 20s? And for us, it was this identification that there was a potential for international law, in particular, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples to be a leverage point to support indigenous water justice, to support our autonomy and our self-determination in our efforts to protect the water. And so this meant that indigenous water justice actually is about the socioeconomic, the cultural and the political institutions that we as indigenous peoples have that are put forward to protect water. 
And so the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples has numerous articles that also delineate the ways in which Indigenous rights as individuals and collectives are protected and how they can support the way, the unique ways in which both traditional and contemporary and uncharted as of yet, that we choose to defend water and to protect water. And so we grounded this approach in using UNDRIP, using the, the United Nations Declaration on the, rights of the, on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples to support Indigenous water rights in Article 3. Because Article 3 of UNDRIP states that Indigenous peoples have the right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. There is no way that Article 3 can be fully realized without the ability as nations to protect the water, to protect that relation. And there are other articles, as I mentioned, where we saw these deep and embedded connections of water and self-determination. In meeting our basic human needs as indigenous peoples, when we think about the boil water advisories, the drinking water advisories, the no water advisories that have been persistent and consistent across so many of our nations for decades, there are, the, there are ways in which UNDRIP protects our international right to basic human needs, like health and sanitation, water for meeting those livelihood needs, as well as for economic development, employment opportunities, and other conditions. And those include Articles 20, 24, 26, 28, and 32 of UNDRIP. But there's also ways in which UNDRIP protects our cultural rights to water and self-determination through water-related cultural and spiritual traditions, as well as our intergenerational stewardship obligations, UNDRIP has protections under international law for those activities, including under articles 11, 15, 25, 26, and 31. And then in the political sphere, UNDRIP also notes that internal governmental autonomy over water resources is an inherent right that we hold as indigenous nations and that external participation in water-related decision-making, including our right to free prior and informed consent, is a protected right under international law, as articulated in Articles 4, 5, 18, 19, 26, 27, 28, and 32. So really, our findings were showing that the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is inherently a declaration that allows for us and supports our continuity and protection of water. It's in a lot of ways, I think we argued and you could argue, it's a water declaration. It's a declaration that allows for our continued stewardship and intergenerational capacity building for the protection of water and our relationships to water. And so the path forward looks like empowering indigenous water law. This isn't necessarily under isn't necessarily some new or profound instrument of law. It is a recognition of the inherent rights that we hold as indigenous peoples and an international recognition thereby. It also asserts and affirms that we have cultural and spiritual water uses that should and can be protected under international law. And that we also have the unique ability to develop distinct political partnerships that can support water justice and work to heal many of the water injustices that we face today. So I wanna focus in on this aspect of indigenous water law. So tracing from indigenous water justice to indigenous water law, how does this get us to a place of planetary well-being or healing as noted in the title talk? Well, justice. We come back to this principle of this concept of indigenous water justice, one of those key words being justice. What does it mean? And more specifically, who is justice for? When we think about the context of indigenous water law, of indigenous law more broadly, law is not structured in such a manner that the only persons recognized are those of human beings. Rather, within indigenous legal systems around the world, we recognize that natural entities, such as the water itself, is a being that has its own inherent rights, that has a level of care and imbued duty of obligation upon us as human beings to protect. There's a symbiotic relationship, an aspect 
of justice that is not only procedural, distributional, recognitional, but restorative, relational, where we have a duty of care. So what does this look like in practice? Well, what we're starting to see now from 2007, when UNDRIP was first signed by the UN General Assembly, to the in subsequent endorsements by the, let's say, missing states of Canada, Australia, the United States, and New Zealand, and now the domestic adoption of UNDRIP by the Canadian state, we're seeing a new movement emerge where, yes, this codification at an international scale of indigenous rights, we've, we've gotten that, we've met that. Now it's about action. It's about implementation. It's about what does the future of planetary health and well-being look like? And that future is a recognition of our inherent indigenous legal systems. It's a reclamation. It's a process of rematriation. And it's hopefully leading to the birth of a new generation of earth defenders and earth lawyers and those who actually can fight in defense of nature, in defense of water and use our indigenous laws in that defense. And for some, you may have heard it called earth jurisprudence, eco law, but I like to call it earth law. And it is a recognition of how we can honor and protect nature's inherent rights to exist, thrive, and evolve. This isn't a grant of personhood. This isn't a delegation of rights to a natural entity. It's recognizing that we as human beings are part of the environment, not the dominators, not those who have a superiority over nature, but who are gifted an experience of relationality with the natural world. And with that gift comes responsibility and duties of care. And hopefully that leads to a future in which humans and nature flourish together not, at, not as enemies, but as relations. And for so many on this evening's talk and those listening in later on, that may not be a revolutionary idea or concept for you. You may come from an indigenous legal system where that is already ingrained and embedded and something that you have as an innate concept. But for the rest of the world, we are in a process now of relearning, of reconnecting, of building a culture of earth defenders who actually can recognize that they are part of nature and not a dominator. And so much of what I'm going to share in the remaining portion of this evening's talk is also captured in a TED talk that I gave, why lakes and rivers should have the same rights as humans. So if you're interested, I encourage you to share that. And in addition to sharing this recording of this evening, you're welcome to, to share that recording as well with students and colleagues and family. It's a wonderful place to have a conversation about how we can actually restore the inherent rights of nature. But why do we need to do this? What's wrong with the status quo is often the question I am asked. Well, right now, our laws actually legalize the destruction of nature. We've seen a 68% loss in animal populations in the past 50 years. The World Wildlife Fund in their 2020 report found that there were two thirds uh, of a loss in biodiversity around the planet. And some of the most dramatic declines in that biodiversity were in freshwater ecosystems. We have seen more than two thirds of the longest rivers no longer flow freely or wild. And half of the coral reefs have been lost in 30 years we are in a state of planetary crisis. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has alerted us that we are in a state of code red. For many of us, as indigenous scholars Zoe Todd and Heather Davis wrote in their paper on the Anthropocene, as indigenous peoples, many of us have been in this apocalyptic cycle of planetary crisis for centuries. They in fact date it to be oncoming of the Atlantic slave trade and the colonization of the quote unquote new world. And so what we can learn from that is this has been a process over generations and it will require a significant investment of time, resources, 
and new bold thinkers to reimagine and reconstitute our legal systems and our approach to the protection of nature. And so earth law, often called ecocentric law, it's this emerging body of law, largely to, as I mentioned, not necessarily new for indigenous legal systems, but for the broader global legal community. It's an opportunity for this emerging body of law to put forward legal mechanisms by which we can protect, restore, and stabilize the functional interdependency of Earth's life and life support systems. We're seeing new textbooks come out like the one pictured here on Earth law that will help to train a new era of legal and law students, as well as others, undergraduate students as inclusive and community leaders. Everyone has to, has a role to play in the way in which we reimagine our legal systems for planetary protection and well-being. And so what can that look like? You may be familiar with the concept of rights of nature, which I'll go over in a moment, but earth law is all encompassing. It includes ways in which we uh, affirm the crime of ecocide, how we protect animal rights, the rights of future generations, our indigenous legal systems. It also includes human environmental rights, atmospheric trust litigation, as well as guardianship of nature, and so many other burgeoning areas that are still being developed. So ecocide, maybe this is a new term for you. The goal in, uh, within the system of earth law and this burgeoning area is to define ecocide as a crime at the International Criminal Court to really ensure that nations around the world recognize that the destruction of the environment is a crime. France in particular is proposing to recognize ecocide as a crime. And, but because currently ecocide, the destruction of the environment is seen solely as a cost of business something that can be balanced on a budget sheet. And in reality, we are seeing with our loss of biodiversity, with our code red of our climate crisis, this is not simply a cost of business. It has far reaching implications for planetary health and well-being. When we look at the right to a stable climate, this is uh, often talked about in the case of the URENDA, which established a human right to a healthy climate. There's also the Juliana case out of the United States, um, that found, that was arguing uh, for the rights of future generations. Um, but oftentimes we now are seeing that with the Juliana case stalled, that these rights of future generations may have to be found and advocated for through legislative bodies. We've seen bills of rights for uh, Lake Erie and a new one that was introduced in the House um, of Representatives for the state of New York that looks at granting um, recognizing the legal rights of the Great Lakes. And so there are emerging ways in which this can happen through a juris, um, a judicial branch, a legislative branch, it can happen through an executive branch and all other types of government branches. There's a place and a, and a process through which to mobilize earth law in your local community and across scales. And in the context of the rights of future generations, this comes from a case out of the Philippines, the Supreme Court, in fact, in 1993, in uh, a case known as Opposa um, versus uh, Factorin, which found in, in the holding that every generation has a responsibility to the next to preserve the rhythm and harmony of nature for the full enjoyment of a balanced and healthful ecology. So you also note that although Earth law in its modern exploration is being conceptualized in, in, in the past decade or so, it is based and rooted in a history of emergent law stemming from the 1970s on. You have pieces like um, Christopher Stone, Why Trees Should Have Standing. But a lot of their inspiration has come from our knowledge as indigenous peoples and the grassroots movements that are happening around the planet to codify again and to recognize these inherent relationships that we have with the natural world. So this is a global movement that expands across constitutional amendments, court decisions, local ordinances and townships, 
and many of our indigenous laws. We saw in Aotearoa, New Zealand, the recognition of the Honganui River and Aotearoa in 2017, um, by the, uh, that was a cooperative recognition between the state government and the iwi uh, Honganui, the local tribe. We've also seen in the United States, uh, tribal nations mobilizing to pass indigenous tribal and first nation laws that recognize the inherent rights of different natural entities, including rivers like the Klamath River, as well as most recently here within the Canadian context, the Magpie River that was jointly recognized by the Innu First Nation and a local Quebec municipality. So when we think about those pathways forward for indigenous water justice, partnership is very much critical and crucial to how we imagine a shared future and the protection of water. And so as I noted, this is a global movement that has been ongoing for decades. We saw in the early parts of the 2000s, the formation of the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature known as GARN. This is an alliance of people and organizations supporting rights of nature. We had one of the first rights of nature laws recognized in the United States or in North America in 2007 by a local municipality in Pennsylvania that attempted to prevent the dumping of toxic waste. Ecuador established the rights of Pachamama, recognizing that nature Pachamama has a right to reproduce and exist in 2008. And we saw the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth emerge out of Bolivia in 2010. And so many more initiatives around the world have grown in, in the past few decades. L uh, luckily for us, they've been captured by the UN Harmony with Nature Initiative that was formed in 2009 and you can by a UN General Assembly resolution. And you can go to the UN Harmony with Nature website and learn more about all of the different types of initiatives that have been emerging in recent years. And we've also seen growing international support. It's not just the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples that empowers our movement in expanding earth law, but also the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN. Their resolution 100 says, uh, notes the incorporation of the rights of nature as the organizational focal point in IUCN's decision-making. They've also noted the importance of thinking about earth law in the context of marine protected areas. Remember that the water connects us all. So there is no bifurcation, demarcation of salt and fresh. Yes, we know the distinction, but ultimately it's all connected through the hydrologic cycle. So when we think about how we are protecting water, it's across all of these different waterscapes and making sure that there is a holistic vision for management and for protection and for relationship. And the UN through their World Charter for Nature as well as the UN Harmony with Nature programs continue to build up these holistic approaches. And we've also seen instances even in our food systems with the Food and Agricultural Organization recognizing that sustainable development is interwoven and must be connected towards more holistic balances of human well-being and ecological well-being. So what is this rights of nature concept? Well, the hope is that it helps us to correct flaws within the legal system. It recognizes that nature has fundamental rights to exist, thrive, and be free from pollution. The ultimate goal is that we are working to restore nature's health, planetary health. It supports human rights, it supports indigenous rights, and it supports other rights. Because remember, we are part of nature. When we heal the environment, we heal ourselves. So it also is a process by which we work to give nature a voice. That can be through guardianship bodies, through political representation, um, and sometimes it's also through processes by which we ensure that a rights of nature framework is considered in how we make decisions. And so again, it recognizes that nature has rights to exist, to thrive and evolve. And because it exists, this also creates obligations upon us as humans to act differently, to do better. And it's a recognition, not a granting. These rights already exist. We as humans are just catching up with nature's reality, or in maybe in some instances, reconnecting and reaffirming that understanding, that inherent connection. It's about also hopefully once we establish that these rights exist, that we change the paradigm 
that we think of a new way of ordering our legal systems so that we go from being owners of nature to having a responsibility towards nature, that we dismantle these Eurocentric ideologies of property rights over nature, and that we become more nature-centric and less human-centric. Ultimately, again, seeing us as humans as part of nature and not separate from it. And in doing so, we start to address the root causes of injustice. We start to address the root causes of water injustices prevalent around our planet. Because from viewing nature as solely a resource and a property to an entity to be respected, we transform fundamentally our value system, our approach, our understanding of relationship building to nature and to water. And it starts to create this rebalancing effect where human and environmental needs be, are weighed together in a holistic approach, that we don't place human needs above the environment's needs, and that we start to reverse this backwards hierarchy where economic systems and human systems are seen above the rights of natural systems. And in fact, we actually recognize that we are codependent that we are interconnected and interwoven and that our mutual survival is dependent on one another. And so that, that within that is embedded this, this hope, this idea for our future that no matter how stringent restrictions are or the existence of zoning laws, our current systems don't let us say no to harmful activity. It simply tells us where it will go. So our existing status quo is not about how do we prevent harm to nature, but how do we move it somewhere else where it might be passable? That's not just. It's not just for us as human beings, potentially for those communities who have borne the disproportionate burdens of injustice, of carrying toxic waste, carrying landfills, carrying proximity to extractive industries. And it's not just for the water itself who has to also bear those disproportionate burdens of harm. And when we think about rights, it's a legal protection. It starts to transform us away from seeing nature as solely a property interest to be consumed and commodified. It also recognizes that human interests can no longer outweigh environmental health, that our needs and desires and wants are no longer the preeminent voice for planetary healing. We have to be considered, if we want to exist 100 years from today, we have to address our climate crisis. We have to address the planetary imbalance of, imbalances that we are seeing. And so that requires different standards, being ecocentric, holistic, thinking about systems health, recognizing that we have a need for nature and for natural entities like water to have legal standing to be able to defend themselves, to speak out against industry or corporations or others who would do them harm. And let's take a zoom in for a moment. What does this look like in the context of water, in particular river systems? Well, right now the status quo is that our rivers globally are over diverted. They are manipulated and engineered out of their wild systems. And the scope of protection for rivers, riverine systems is often about navigable waters. There are so many other aspects of waterscapes that go unprotected because they are not deemed to be navigable. We also see the instances of destructive dams that have been encouraged, oftentimes that are even proliferating now because of the intensity we have to meet climate targets and to ensure that we're heeding the call for more and increased renewable energy. But energy justice and re renewable energy is not energy justice per se, right? We can't just replicate bad behavior in the renewable energy sector. We have to be conscientious about how the proliferation of renewable energy might, pla just might place disproportionate burdens on some communities over others and also place disproportionate benefits to some communities over others. And so we've seen so many uh, indigenous leaders as well come out in defense of their rivers, in defense of their waterscapes, in, in against these proliferations of destructive dams. And our existing status quo 
also sees rivers as property without a voice in the legal system. Riparian rights, a claim to the river, a property stake in the river. How different could our world be if we reimagined our status quo? If we imagined a future in which rivers have rights, where rivers have a right to flow, to their natural flow, not to the engineered, manipulated, banned, consumed, consumed process by which they should flow. That we look to ensure the health of the entire watershed, inclusive of groundwater, not just those that are visible to human perception. That we work to ensure that dams are discouraged or prohibited in spaces in which they don't make sense, that they would further disproportionately burden marginalized communities, further aspects of environmental racism, provide disproportionate benefits to companies over people. And that we actually start to see rivers as persons, as living beings that have a voice that we need to listen to. And then I get asked the question after saying all of that, well, who gets to speak for the river? Who are these guardians? Well, it has to be localized and context specific. The duties of a guardian are also going to be specific to that local context, but they might receive information on violations. They might make recommendations. They might serve as the face of nature or the river in litigation. Additionally, when we think about who serves as guardians. Composition could be community members, it could be experts, poets, spiritual leaders, indigenous peoples. It should include diversity and gender equity and broad expertise and intergenerational capacity. One of the greatest insights in my work with water walkers is that we, they said we need more grandmothers making the laws. And I think that's so true. We need to ensure that those who have the power of decision making is inclusive of our elders, but also inclusive of our young people. There was such beauty in being able to see grandmother Josephine Ba work with Autumn Peltier, her, her, her niece, and being able to see that intergenerational connection of elders and young people coming together to imagine a water future for Anishinaabek to see that, that's what we need around the world because those voices are there. The elders, the knowledge holders, those who have that experience, they are ready and keen to share and to guide us towards our shared future. And so are those young people. That's where we've seen the climate strikes. That's where we've seen uh, Greta Thunberg and others emerge who are the voices of this generation. And they have solutions, but are we ready to listen to them? And ultimately, when we think about these guardians, we have to ensure that decision making is in the best interest of nature and that we allow for there to be challenges and forums for grievances to be laid against those who would harm and destroy the natural world. And I will say that solutions are already here. They're already being designed, as we mentioned, this is a part of a global movement. And indigenous earth law includes constitutional amendments. Indigenous nations are thinking about their constitutions, they're revising them, they're amending them, they're creating new ones. Um, and those are really amazing opportunities to think through a solutions-oriented framework for empowering the inherent rights of nature. But sometimes maybe a constitutional amendment is, is, is a little too much for, for First Nation or Tribal Nation to start with. So we're seeing tribal council resolutions, we're seeing band council resolutions, we're seeing intertribal organization resolutions um, and co-governance arrangements like with the Magpie River. They, but we, we have to start somewhere. And a lot of these aspects are also about respecting our connection to nature, respecting our connection to the natural world, and empowering these ancient practices of relationality. And we've done that for centuries, for millennia, through our treaty mechanisms as Indigenous peoples. And we have new treaty mechanisms that are emerging. One that is a great example of Indigenous Earth Law is the Northern Tribes Buffalo Treaty, between a treaty between First Nations and Tribal Nations along the US and Canadian Northern border for the protection of Buffalo. And we're seeing more of these types of treaties uh, being discussed and emerging uh, treaties looking at the protection of wolves and other species. 
We also see direct, direct appeals through the court systems, through amicus briefs and other types of litigation measures, who also affirm indigenous earth law and indigenous laws that protect the rights of nature. And also we're seeing new models emerge like declarations, like water declarations and earth declarations. Uh, the Treaty 3 Council uh, Nishnabek Water Declaration that came out in 2019 is a beautiful example of a water declaration. We also saw the Grassy Narrows Aki Declaration that came out recently as well. These are all instances of indigenous legal mechanisms being put forward to protect our inherent relationships to nature. And so ultimately, I hope today inspires you to learn more about earth law, to learn more about what your role can be and should be, because we all have one, in being water protectors, in protecting water is life, and working to address many of the systemic water injustices that are plaguing our communities, our society, and our world today. Because ultimately, planetary well-being falls upon all of us. Many of the resources I shared today are from the Earth Law Center. Uh, they're a wonderful organization that partners with indigenous peoples and others around the world to advance different mechanisms of Earth Law. So if you'd like to learn more, I encourage you uh, to reach out on their website uh, to see some of their resources. Uh, they're a great uh, wealth of information and repository for these emerging areas, along with the UN Harmony with Nature website, as mentioned earlier. So with that, Tabutni, thank you. It's been such a pleasure to be in conversation. My email is there as well as my Twitter, and I look forward to where we go for the remainder of this evening. Chimiigwech so much, uh, Dr. Leonard, for your talk tonight. I know for myself, I'm definitely inspired. And uh, as you had mentioned, we're in a time where there's, right, we're in a time of crisis. There's increasingly uh, more uncertainty and so when I was listening to your talk, I, it definitely had an a inspiring message and, and one of hope as, as well. Um, and maybe for me, um, I'll just ask people if they want to put some questions um, into the chat box. Uh, and if I could just share a couple of my takeaways uh, from your talk, I really appreciated how you provided a, a vision, uh, but then you also provided some concrete steps um, and actions of, of how to move that forward. And I feel sometimes we can get stuck in, in okay, this is our, our vision, but, but how do we actually do this? Um, and I thought it was so beautiful how you actually, um, you know, had some examples of, of the water and how she could actually be our teacher through this. So when you were talking about how the water guides us, um, and, and how all the waterways are connected. So in our approach to water law and, and water justice, we also need to, to think about those interconnections and, and those partnerships. Um, and I, I think Elder DeRoy, I heard you talk about this a, a bit as well when you spoke about how the water can be so powerful, but so kind. Um, and I think that was part of Den, uh, Dr. Leonard's message here today of, of we need to uh, decolonize some of those practices, those systems of domination and uh, be kind to our, our relatives and be kind to the water. There was one question that I, I did see in the chat. Um, someone had asked if you could just speak a little bit about uh, who is a, a water walker and, and what is water walking? And maybe if I could just add on to that question a bit, um, if you could speak about water walking in the context of uh, governance as well and in relationship to earth law. Wonderful, thank you so much. And I, I love that question. And yes, so so I feel like the best answer to, to who is a water walker um, is actually when I asked that question to, to the water walkers that I, I came to, to know and, and walk with. And they said, it's anyone who wants to be like water. Um, and, and what that means in practice in, in the context of water governance is it's, it's a reclamation of restoring our connection to water, to understanding that the water needs, needs healing, it needs witnesses, it needs those who want to, to be there in prayer, in ceremony, in love, 
um, to have a, a love ethic in our approach to water decision making. Um, and, and so that's that's the best way I can put it. But for um, maybe a more a more scholarly approach, um, I will also recommend uh, the Water Walker book by Joanne Robertson, um, which actually follows the, the life of, of Josephine Manaman Ba, um, who she did not like this term of the original water walker, um, but she is, is somewhat seen in, in that form and fashion. Um, and, and she, along with many other water walkers, um, walked um, the, all of the Great Lakes multiple times, um, over 40,000 kilometers um, in prayer, in ceremony, and in trying to um, raise awareness for many of the threats to, to water. She said all water around the world is threatened. And it's a, it's imperative upon us to do something about it and for it. Um, so this this activity and, and my research and a lot of where I see Earth Law is my space in which I can contribute to do something about it, to imagine a world in which water has rights um, and the inherent rights that it has already born onto this planet um, are recognized. And so that's a that's a little bit about. Uh, the water walkers, there are the Mother Earth water walkers, there are the Nibe, um water walkers, Nibe walks, which is uh, organized by Elder um, uh, Sharon Day, um, and they do a lot of river walks, but also some lake walks, and there are many, many other water walkers around the world. Uh, since Grandmother Josephine Ba started walking for the water um, in the early 2000s, there have been more than 120 water walks, uh, walking in prayer and healing for water bodies all around the world. Um, and now there's a junior water walkers program, which tries to carry on her, her legacy and the legacy of other water walkers um, for elementary school children and children around the world in different classrooms. And um, you can uh, look up all of those programs, uh, just type them into Google and, and they will come up. Um, but such wonderful stories of everyday indigenous women and leaders out there protecting the water. I hope that helps, but I'm happy to answer more questions because I love the water walkers. Be great. Um, and uh, just to bring people's attention to uh, Anna Chief, who does a really amazing job at coordinating uh, this event. Uh, as Dr. Leonard's been talking, she's been putting the resources that are mentioned uh, into the chat box. So for example, there's one there for Joanne Robertson's book. Um, and I'm seeing there are a couple more questions popping up as well as there's a lot of uh, praise and thanks and gratitude uh, for the work that you do as well. So there's a question here of, um, someone wanting to know about more about the role of the Global South, um, as well as minority communities connecting uh, in regards to water justice. And is there spaces outside of, of the UN uh, for that work to happen on a global scale as well? That is an excellent question. I definitely think the, the advocacy, the movement building, the um, love ethic of the water walkers has been a really prime example of, of community coming together across all different parts of the world. Um, for other areas of water justice movement building, I think there are some really great uh, NGOs and organizations like Earth Law Center. Um, there are additional organizations. There's an organization called CELDIF, which is the Community Environmental Defense um, Law Foundation. And they've been really great also in sort of advocating uh, for rights of nature. Um, there are some really wonderful additional scholars through the GARN um, uh, programs of the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature, scholars, um, activists. That global community, I think, is one of the, the biggest connectors of communities and individuals across the planet for advancing earth law. So definitely would, would champion um, GARN as a resource. They have a listing of their earth law experts or, or the folks who are you know, the champions of, of these initiatives on the ground. Um, and then also, I know it is a UN in, um, organization, the UN Harmony with Nature program, but they also list a lot of the folks who are working to advance um, earth law in their communities. And it's not just politicians or people with letters at the end of their name. There's everyday citizens who are doing this work. And so that's why I like those, um, those programs that I've mentioned so far. 
Miigwech. And the next question comes from Judy, and she's asking, um, where has there been suspenseful water protection and justice? Hmm. I, I feel like I might need clarity on suspenseful. <laughs> Um, Julie, if you're, if you're open to clarifying your question, uh, feel free to, um, just thinking of some, some really good examples of, well, water protection. So one there, I love children's books, obviously. Um, so Joanne Robertson's well, the water walker book, but also my, my next go-to recommendation is the water protector, um, which actually follows the, the wonderful, experiences of fighting for the water and defense of the water um, after um, at and, and after Standing Rock um, for in defense of against the Dakota Access Pipeline. So I think that is where we also saw sort of a burgeoning emergence of a conversation on Indigenous water justice was um, during that, that occupation and defense movement. Um, so successful, there we go, yep, successful movement. So that would be one example. I think we have seen many instances of that also across um, the Canadian landscape and context. I also will often point to the research happening at McMaster University and uh, Don Martin Hill um, and uh, the youth activism of Makasha Looking Horse who through um, their campaign uh, was able to expel Nestle for, for, you know, really if we're getting down to it, the work of youth activists and local activists in uh, the Waterloo, Guelph, um, Haldeman Tract region were able to expel Nestle because they were extracting um, gross amounts of, of groundwater without uh, proper compensation. Um, and Six Nations in many instances does not have adequate access to a sufficient quantity and quality of water to meet their, their daily needs. So there have been persistent boil water advisories in that, in that community for, for decades. And so uh, those would be really great examples, I think, of, of, on, of on the ground, but there's so many. I, I feel like that's also part of this work is it's not that people aren't out there defending the water, it's that we're not listening. We're not listening to the people and we're not listening to the water itself. And so we have to open up our, our ears. Um, and a part of my work is, is to do that too, is to listen um, and to document and to amplify the voices of, of those who, who are listening and doing the good work. And the next question, um, if you could comment about where does Canada sit on the world stage in terms of water justice? So I know you've mentioned a couple of successes in your, in your last comments. Um, and you've also spoken a lot in your talk about the Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So I'm wondering if as part of that response, you could also comment on, on that as well and, and where we are in terms of meaningfully um, implementing uh, the UN DRIP. Yes, thank you so much for that question. And I actually, I will, I will comment on that word meaningfully. <laughs> I, that, that word is so um, manipulated by, by, by colonizers and settlers and particularly in political institutions. Um, and we think it means one thing as indigenous peoples and they think it means a totally different thing. So I, I say, you know, UNDRIP, even in the domestic adoption that, that has been put through, um, through parliament, it's not a meaningful adoption of UNDRIP. It needs to be a full implementation and a domestic adoption of UNDRIP. And there's no you know, hemming and hawing on which articles you adopt and which articles you implement, which ones you don't. That's not how the law works. Um, if, you, if you didn't want to adopt it in its entirety, then, then, then you would outline that in, in the domestic codification. That said, humans are prone to error. Um, and I think that it will continue to be a challenge this, this question of what is meaningful, um, a challenge that it persists for the Canadian state um, and for us as, as Indigenous peoples and for First Nations within the Canadian context to, to constantly hold um, you know, political leaders' feet to the fire to ensure that there is a joint and shared understanding of what that implementation looks like and that it is done in such a manner that it actually protects the water and it protects uh, Indigenous rights. And so I am hopeful, but I am cautiously hopeful uh, because unfortunately, like our history has shown us, we have, to, uh, we have to be present, we have to be listening, we have to be constantly active to ensure that the implementation actually occurs the way that it, it's meant to. Um, and, and that there's, again, no, no hemming or hawing on, on what different articles and principles mean. And that's why 
the, the development of this paper was very instrumental. Um, we, we did it around the time where Canada was saying, you know, in front of the, the UN forums, what well, we're going to do a full implementation of UNDRIP, but they hadn't actually adopted it. There was an actual domestic codification. And so we're hoping that this article and future articles that have built on it will actually empower nation states to understand that there is no meaningful or there is no semi-adoption. It's, it's a full scale implementation of a document that was 40 years in the making at the UN international level. That said, I think in terms of other water injustices present across Canada, there are many. Um, and when we think about the water crises that are facing our communities, you, you know, in the TED talk, I, I mentioned Neshkintaga First Nation, who's been under a boil water advisory for more than 27 years. Now we've seen some of the drinking water advisories be addressed by uh, the Trudeau administration and be, um, be somewhat, I guess, accommodated, um, amended, remediated. Um, but that said, these are long-term drinking water advisories. So those that have persisted for more than a 12 month period. That does not account for those communities like Six Nations, for example, that has experienced intermittent drinking water advisories that may be short term, but can go on for decades. So if you have a three to six month drinking water advisory or a three week drinking water advisory, but it happens every other month in a calendar year, that's not having adequate access to water and sanitation in a global north country and a very wealthy country like Canada. Um, and so what are the reasonings behind that? colonialism, environmental racism. We haven't addressed the systemic issues present in both Canada and the United States that have led to these, uh, these issues of water injustice. And so that's also why we see many scholars and others leaning in to reconciliation, leaning in to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission reports and the calls to action, because there has to be a level of truth bearing. There has to be a level of acknowledgement that water colonialism that water racism has existed within the Canadian state for centuries. And once that's acknowledged, then you can start to work to heal. You can start to work to say that these systems of oppression have not only oppressed individuals and communities and nations, but also the water itself. And we're getting there, but these conversations are just now emerging. And I think in large part due to where earth law creates a space for these forums of conversation to exist. And you, you also spoke about the importance of uh, local relationships and local contacts. So maybe to end our conversation today, I could ask a question um, about wampum. So when you were speaking about your territory and wampum coming from your territory, um, and I, I just think it um, makes us so mindful about water law and water justice that uh, wampum, which is so central to governance for Indigenous peoples, really comes from that place of the water. So just, just is there anything else that you could share about wampum in relation to water and governance? Yes, I, I would be happy to. I actually, I have a new, um, a new area of my, of my scholarship that actually explores this. And obviously, I'm committed to this, to this idea of justice. Um, and I think that wampum actually was crafted in such a manner that there is a lot of knowledge of law and of justice, indigenous knowledge embedded in, in wampum and in wampum making. Um, you actually look at a lot of, of our traditional teachings and historical texts, and they said that if you were to hold wampum, you, you could not speak a lie. It was a truth teller. Um, and when we think about treaties and treaty making, I think there was a great foresight of the, upon our ancestors in selecting that particular being to be the treaty maker. And, and why did they do that? Why, why pick this, this mollusk relative that lives in an estuary and environment? Well, if you actually look at the life of a bivalve of the mercenaria mercenaria, the Northern Quahog that the purple shell comes from, it's a filter feeder. It takes out all of the pollution in water and it, and it, and it captures it and it puts the clean water back out. It cleans systems. So in that way, it also is physically a biological manifestation of truth keeping, of taking out all of the bad words that you could have and only putting out 
good words, good medicine, good water. And so I think that's why wampum was what was used to create these treaty relationships, to understand that the first principle of justice is truth. Hmm. No, I'm just so thankful that you're able to join us here today. And uh, just the, the talk that you gave and, and your responses to, I think it's just such a great example of the the strength um, within our Indigenous knowledge systems um, and how holistic they are. And you've really spoken about law and culture and, and spiritual and personal relationships and, and environmental knowledge and, and really brought it all together, I, I think, again, in a message of, of hope, but also some concrete steps to move forward. So Chimi Gwich, um, at this point, I would like to welcome back uh, President McPherson. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Lana and Dr. Leonard. Thank you so much for sharing your, your lecture, your insights. Um, and I agree with Lana. It was so interesting. And of course, you know, for me, lots of new, new ways of thinking. And um, I concur with the comments Lana has made. And she comes from a place of incredible knowledge and, and uh, experience. But I think for all of our listeners this evening, they will have learned so much and thought about things in some different ways. So, so thank you. And thank you for taking the time to so thoughtfully and thoroughly answer the questions that were put into the, the chat for us this evening. I would like to, on behalf of a very grateful audience and a very grateful university, present you with a certificate. It's a small token of our appreciation for um, coming to the university through this virtual forum and uh, providing us with your lecture this evening. And uh, uh, Anna, thank you very much for, for putting up a copy of, of the certificate. And uh, Kelsey, we'll, we'll be forwarding this in the mail for you, but, but thank you very much, Miigwech, for, for a wonderful lecture this evening. Abuni, thank you so much. This is very kind. I appreciate it. Yeah, I would also before I before the evening is closed uh, and the session, we say good night. I also want to personally express my thanks to to Lana, to Dr. Ray, for being a wonderful moderator for the session today, and also to Anna Chief, um, to Elder DeRoy and all of our uh, team here at Lakehead University who has coordinated and hosted a wonderful event this evening. Thank you very much to everybody. Back to you, Lana. Miigwech. At this point, I'd like to call upon uh, Elder DeRoy, if you could please uh, close us off in a good way tonight. Uh, bonjour, Dr. Kelsey Leonard. Just, I love what you're doing for the planet. Uh, it touches my heart, knowing that such a young person is doing so much for everyone and for the spirit of the water, Manitoba. You know, um, it's just like to, to hear all the names to like Joseph Bimba and all of the dedication and sacrifices that she made in her life, eh, to protect that water, to defend it. And, and always talking about the natural law, about all these beings that have a spirit and they're listening. Like I was watching the water respond to your words and it was just moving and shaking. And as I have my offerings here for, for the water, for Nebe, Manitoba, for, for our lives and for our ancestors, and I have a gift for the earth, our mother, eh? so that she will continue to take good care of us today and for our future generations to come. And so with that, I'm just so touched by all your words and all of the work that you've done, all of your advocacy. And I am, I'm looking forward to hearing more of what you're doing in your life and, and all of the defense work you're doing, the protection of the water, for the water justice, for the environment justice. 
making sure that this planet will be, you know, in a good way for our future generations to come, that we honor everything that gives us life today. So chi miigwech to everyone that made this possible tonight, everyone in our circle and this, and this virtual lodge, eh? Because that's why I feel like, you know, people are coming through the doors of the wigwam. <laughs> And it just makes me feel so good and to sit with the water nebe and to sit with all the sacred items that keep us strong each and every day you know so i'm going to sing this song and give thanks to all nagman you know all the songs that are out there that talk about the importance of water and how water is and how water moves and how strong water is and so this, this song interprets to be strong, like the water, you know, Zonkaze, and to give thanks to our ancestors, to Creator, for all of this, this whole environment, all of the elements that keep us alive every day, all of our relatives, the rock, the, you know, the plants and the animal beings that keep us alive. And so we need to be those good stewards. We need to, you know, be on this path to be responsible. We can talk as much as we want. It's the action that we need to see. And I find with COVID, we've kind of reversed because everybody's doing getting water bottles again, individual wrapped items, those things and plastic gloves, our face masks, all of those things, it just hurts when we have to do that. But in, in another form, it's protecting people again, right? And so that's one thing I think about, we need to revert back to how we were before. We were starting to do really good. <laughs> so we need to get back to that. Uh -huh. So the song is a very powerful song. <clears throat> it comes from the Red Shadow Singers. <clears throat> Yeah, we are. 
for tonight. Gigaba Wabman, everybody. We'll see you again. Hopefully, we'll cross our paths again. Aha, miigwech. Miigwech, Audrey. Miigwech, Dr. Leonard. And again, chi uh, miigwech to the ladies for all their support on coordination, Anna, as well as Sheila, um, and to President McPherson for uh, supporting this, this initiative. I hope you have a, a good night. And we'll see you again. Miigwech.